Well, well, welcome to everybody here in the room and um, who is watching online. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to see you here and to welcome you uh, to this rather grand um, uh, cinema. It's probably one of the grandest cinemas in London, I think, but nobody knows that it's here. Uh, and we want to thank Vulio for their support for this event. Um, so we've got f four fantastic speakers here, and in a second I'm going to ask them each to sort of set up their, their stalls. Uh, and the, the subject of the evening is how charities can best be heard by policymakers and the media uh, to support their aims of helping the most vulnerable people uh, at this particular time. Um, uh, we're not going to labour the point this evening. I think we'll hear some graphic accounts of the cost of living crisis which we're living in and which is likely to get worse, I think, before it gets better. And we know the the the... the um, coalition of conditions that have led to this through the pandemic, through the war in Ukraine, Brexit, the cost of energy, uh, fuel, high inflation, tax rises, stagnant wages, uh, and the pain that that is causing uh, millions of households. And I think uh, all our uh, panel tonight in different ways are at the front line of dealing with the consequences of that. So I'm just going to very briefly um, introduce them with one line each because I'm sure uh, as they talk you'll learn more about their work. So immediately to my left is uh, Barbara Keeley, who is the Shadow Minister of, uh, for Arts and Civil Society and a member for Worsley and Eccles South since 2010. Then we've got Lara Stanley, who's the Campaigns and Public Affairs Managers for Citizens Advice. Uh, on her left is Nicole Sykes, the Policy and Communications Director for Pro Bono Economics. And right over there, who uh, reminded me that we were last on a platform together in 1997, which shows an amazing uh, grip on uh, memory, which is better than mine, is Dr. Matthew Soamimo, the Head of Public Affairs and Social Policy at the Salvation Army. So why don't we just go in, um, in order, starting uh, with you, Barbara, and uh, as I say, if you can just... Uh, keep to a few minutes and, and, uh, and then we'll have some questions and, and I hope um, everybody in the audience m might have questions uh, uh, yourselves. So Barbara. Thanks. Um, and, uh, I was appointed to my role in late March so I haven't been there very long. But I, do. Um, I do understand, I just wanted to start to say I do understand the difficult position that, that charities and civil society organisations are in. Um, I know that many of you have had big issues to deal with during the COVID pandemic, but, but now the cost of living crisis that we're discussing today, and the crisis in NHS and social care, I think some of you will be affected very badly by that. And uh, uh, the Charity Aid Foundation last week gave me a, uh, a stick of, I'm not turned off. <laughs> Is that better? Fruit, yes, fruit, <laughs> fruit and yogurt. Yes, that's better. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the number of people I know uh, donating has fallen by five million since 2019. So I understand what a difficult time it is. But Alan asked me to talk about how best to communicate and get onto the radar of politicians in these difficult times. You've only got so much you can do. They've only got so much time. So I think for most MPs, there are a, a limited range of issues, campaigns and charities with which they're involved across their own interests. Typically, they would attend events on those issues, take up campaigns and possibly pledge action, have photos taken at event, published on social media. Matthew, you were talking about that. Um, even that level of interaction takes a certain amount of time. But I think the thing that's important in these difficult times is how you can go further than that. Because there are issues, campaigns, charities for which an MP may become a champion and do much more. So th that's the point, I think, where they start to take the initiative. Um, they would set up and run an all-party group of MPs and peers. I'm about to launch one next Monday. Uh, they would ask for and lead debates on an issue, ask lots of questions in questions and statements, push that item up the political agenda, maybe bring in private members' legislation and move amendments uh, on government legislation. 
So uh, to, to, to test beyond myself, you know, what, what are the issues that, that, that do that, I spoke to a number of colleagues. And it was interesting that what came out, well, the primary driver was a constituent with the issue who met the MP and told them their story. For many, many MPs, that is a driver to them doing a huge amount of work on an issue. Um, one of my colleagues um, has done work for years on the contaminated blood issue uh, and it's been a very difficult issue to move government on uh, but she has worked on that um, after hearing that story of injustice to one of her constituents. I had uh, a colleague who has done a great deal of work on pancreatic cancer which is not one of the foremost cancers in terms of outcomes or research funding um, but he had constituents uh, who'd had that and realised how bad the treatment was. Uh, I uh, The issue that I'm taking up is the treatment of autistic people and people with learning disabilities in inpatient units, which is a historic injustice, a massive injustice. Uh, since the Winterbourne View uh, scandal, but uh, very little gets done about it. And I know colleagues who do a lot of violence against women and girls, of course, which we um, have seen far too much of in recent times. So there are obviously lots of other drivers, but it was amazing how, in talk my talking to colleagues, that one came out again and again and again. It's just one particular story of injustice, one uh, you know, set of, 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 uh, of facts about a situation that just lodges with that MP, and then they will do all those extra things. And I thought that's worth mentioning. Clearly, sometimes that's... Um, also a family connection, so one, one colleague said her son had dyslexia, so she became very driven by special educational needs. Uh, someone who lost his mother to a, a ovarian cancer. I have a family member with autism, which is why it's, it's, it's quite an issue to me. Um, uh, lots of uh, uh, MPs campaign on dementia because they've had a parent with dementia. Um, so I'm just talking about that as a way of kicking us off, in that how often do we think about what is the primary driver because very often uh, what happens is uh, that campaigning involves writing maybe trying to get 10, 20, a number of, of constituents to write in all identical emails on an issue saying, please go to this event, uh, I've got arthritis, I'm waiting for my joint surgery, please go to this event. That's not going to stick um, in anyone's mind, that's not going to be the primary driver. So um, I, I hope that's helpful. Um, bring this back to the cost of living. I think it's more vital than ever that MPs understand just how tough the cost of living crisis is for their constituents. Uh, and I've, I've got a, a route to doing that through a charity that I'm involved with. We do uh, food distribution on Wednesdays. And so sometimes I, uh, if, if I'm there on Wednesdays in the constituency, I walk down the line of people that have come for food and just talk to them about how they're, how they're managing. But it's really very important to do that uh, because it's so hard to get across to people living in the curious world we do just up the road there what people are going through so i'm sure we'll have further questions but that's my uh, that's my starting point that's fascinating and then and just to pick up on the point that you made the um the, the sort of write-in campaign where where people cut and paste an email even if you get that in, in volume you tend to sort of discount it it has less impact on you? It, it has a lot less impact. I mean, it's, it's, the, the examples I quoted, and I did talk to quite a, quite a few MPs to pick up examples from them. I mean, the, the one colleague who worked on contaminated blood, that was one case. That was one constituent that went to mm. her with that case. And she has done years and years and years of work on that issue. She has run uh, groups, found other MPs, you know, browbeat the other MPs into coming to meetings, speaking in debates, that type of thing. And so effectively, I think if you can connect with those things, what you're connecting with is somebody in Parliament who's doing the work you want to do, yeah. effectively. And that's, that's why it, it's very important. I mean, I think there's a place for the, um, for, the, for the 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 emails, but it's never as good yeah. in terms of getting somebody so much on board as, as an individual case. Laura, what's your experience, especially in, in recent weeks and months. Yeah, of course. So um, for anyone who doesn't know, Systems Services provides advice on basically everything. So welfare, debt, housing, energy <laughs> bills um, at the moment. And uh, during COVID, but also recently, we've just seen huge demand, like increases every month um, via our website, number of people coming sort of self-help and via our local Systems Advice as well. So that one-to-one -one support. Um, 
I think that's obviously got challenges in itself. Thinking about the topic of today's event, um, it also gives us like a really nice opportunity. So we've got a huge amount of data on what people, what issues people are facing right now. Um, and we've also got those stories as well that you were just saying. So every time someone comes into one of our local citizen advice, the advisor will know, stop, know about their story, know about their life, and we can look at those and see, well, actually, what is impacting people right now. And we use those stories and we use our data to go and chat to people, whether MPs or government regulators, other organisations, and, and the media as well. Um, and I think that sort of is quite a valuable resource. Um, so during, at the start of COVID, the government number 10 were coming to us for those insights because no one else had that level of access. We could daily say, this, this is what people are coming to look for, for advice on. So this is what sort of needs to have action taken out. Um, and I think probably there's three things that we think about when, when we think about engaging. Um, sort of remaining true to our values and our expertise. So as I said, sort of with our data is a really unique resource and that comes with seeing some really heartbreaking trends, especially at the moment. Um, but it's, it's good to be able to, be able to share that. Um, and it's probably unparalleled, I say, in its breadth in the charity sector. And we use this as our USP, I'd say, as a charity. But other charities will have different strengths and sort of knowing what's like right for you. Um, we think about our audience and sort of how we can best reach them and what will engage them. So I think this points to your point as well as being quite targeted with that, mm. whether that's personal interest or in theory, you could engage with so many people. Um, so who is going to listen to you and, and what will make what approach will make them listen? Um, I think we're quite flexible in our approach and we try different things. And we're always really careful not just to flag the problems. We talk about what the solutions could be as well. Um, Sometimes we don't always have the solutions, but it's thinking about what works best in that moment that we know about from our data, and we can always adapt that as we learn more. And that could be a policy change, or it could be maybe like a new service is needed. If there's sort of a gap there. Um, that was very brief. Well done. Um, <laughs> how? Um, just one question. Now we'll come. We'll come back later. But, but from your perspective, we've we've heard the perspective of, of somebody sort of as it were on the receiving end. I mean. Do you find it like a sort of impregnable wall, or do you find actually there are receptive people who are open to, 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 to the messages you're trying to get across? I mean, even more so recently receptive. So we had an event for MPs um, last week, um, and everything was just kicking off. Um, but we had really good turnout, and I think MPs are really interested in knowing what they can do to help their constituents with support at the moment. So I think for us, it's not just about um, providing information about sort of data and policy. It's also, here's some advice you can give to your constituents, here's the support that's available for them. Refer them to a local system advice um, if you need to as well. So there is that openness there, but I'd say, yeah, you have to find that connection, you have to find the one thing that will make that person listen. So we always try and seek that before we reach out with any contact, whether it's a We've got a particular role on a select committee or have been to an event or um, have tabled a PQ. We always look at that first to sense who might be receptive to, to our thoughts. Great. Nicole, the, tell us a little about pro bono economics and then, and then move on from that. Absolutely. So pro bono economics, we do economic research policy analysis for, um, for charities so they can understand their impact. Um, to test out for groups of charities what their kind of policy concerns are um, and then we're also running uh, the Law Family Commission on Civil Society which looks at the charity sector as a whole and how we might unleash that potential. Um, so coming at this sort of from the economic side, um, I guess we're very aware of the sort of multitude of challenges on charities at the moment. You mentioned sort of the CAF uh, statistic something of this sort of second wave of charities that makes campaigning very difficult. So that um, demand from beneficiaries, that, that increased need for a lot of our charitable services, um, perhaps about 40, I believe 40% 40 of charities uh, in our latest survey said that they were going to struggle with the demand that they faced. Um, the sort of second element being around rising costs for charities. Um, and, you know, if staff wages in the charity sector were to keep up with inflation, 
the sector would be facing a £3.3 billion bill. Um, we know that it won't, but that, that's sort of the scale of additional costs just looking at staffing, uh, which is something like 40% of, of, of expenditure. Um, so that, that, that sort of demand, that additional cost, um, and, and how do you break through in this, uh, in, in this environment when, as, as you say, um, giving as well will likely be impacted because uh, donations broadly track what households spend. Um, so I guess in that environment, very, very challenging for charities to, to be breaking through. But I guess I've also been reflecting on the fact that it's been a challenging environment to make your messages break through for the last seven years. Um, we've had referendums, we've had elections, and then more elections, and then leadership. You know, it's, it's been very noisy for a very long time. And I think that's driven a few things in the sector to make them more effective. Um, probably the main one being the, the, the collaboration that we see. Um, particularly, I think, uh, incentivized by the pandemic. But um, certainly our experience is you see more and more sort of coalitions coming together. And, and those coalitions might have started as a coalition around one policy issue, but actually that can grow once you've built those relationships. And I think there's probably more of a, a foundation around uh, collaboration, which is, is really, really important in these times. Um, I, I, I would like to see that grow more. Um, I think with the noisiness, one of my biggest concerns is how do you help small charities' voices reach the surface? Um, and also uh, uh, diverse voices as well. Um, we did a, a poll of sort of 100 MPs, um, which is not a bad, bad sample, um, but a lot of them uh, said that they had concerns about how charities uh, were professional, um, which is, is a slightly loaded term. And they wanted charities to be more professional in how they approached them, but that is also potentially quite exclusionary and that they don't hear voices that don't come in the suited uh, and, 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 you know, I know you so I can, I can speak to you uh, approach. So how do we get more collaborative? How do we make sure that we bring uh, uh, diverse voices along? Um, and obviously coming from uh, the economic side, uh, how do we use data to its best effect? Um, I think we all know that data is very good at generating a headline. If you've got a big figure, um, that is a great way to uh, break through into the media, but also MPs love to be able to pick up a, a number and, and, and use it in the house or, or, or in their own work, um, as do civil servants. Uh, I will say I think Citizens Advice is one of the kind of sector leaders in this area using the data they have about their website in really, really innovative ways, but also the importance of using data well. and when one charity uses data badly, I think that damages all of our reputations. And we also saw from that polling just how concerned, I think something over 50% of conservative MPs um, were concerned about charity data. Nevertheless, a majority of them had used charity data within the last 12 months. Um, so collaboration, I think really important, diversity and, and data in this really challenging time, we've got to be better. Um, uh, uh, and, and at our best to be able to put forward those messages that are really, really crucial at this time. How, uh, how much is social media a crucial factor in, in what you do? Uh, that is a great question. Um, so looking at the uh, uh, sort of what um, MPs say, um, certainly from our polling, social media was a factor um, on how they heard from charities. <coughs> but in terms of their sort of preferred routes, um, interestingly, Labour MPs, the top thing that they came out with was um, using charity websites. Um, apparently, Labour MPs spend a lot of time on charity websites, who knew, but that was where they would go for information. Um, Conservative MPs on the other side were, were much more likely to prefer being invited to an event, um, prefer that sort of space in, in which to communicate. Um, civil servants, I think, so, uh, for them, not really interested in the social media side so much, but give them a report, give them a briefing, and, and, and that was... Um, uh, that was key for them. So there is something, as you said, about how do you target your message? How do you make sure you're not just, um, uh, and, and that risk that you undermine yourself by, by doing two broad brush approaches. People say, oh, actually, I don't want to hear from you because you've sent me a load of, of what I've basically treated as spam. So, so how do you get more targeted? And I, um, uh, using, that, using that data, using information that is available about how politicians like to be contacted um, uh, hopefully should be quite useful to help make sure that we're using our resources in the most effective way possible. Thank you. M Matthew, uh, I mean, you were saying just before we came on that this is an exceptionally tough time mm. for the work you're doing. But 
So Salvation Army is a Christian church and charity. We run one of the largest networks of food banks, but we also provide homelessness services and support people who are experiencing modern slavery. I think the, I'd like to talk about three things. One is the importance of messaging and sharp messaging. Secondly, telling policymakers, particularly civil servants, things that they don't know based on your data. Um, and then lastly, talk about local relationships. So, telling civil servants things they don't know. I think the Trussell Trust really scored when they are able to show the Department from Work and Pensions that the initial rollout of universal credit was pushing people to use food banks. And Amber Rudd responded to that data, which data that DWP did not have themselves, and made a policy change in terms of advanced payments. Now, lots of us in this room would feel that that policy change wasn't sufficient, and the Salvation Army feels it wasn't sufficient. But the key thing is, DWP didn't know that the initial rollout of universal credit was driving people to food banks. So that's a key thing about data. And another message I've got around data is, I'm afraid, get ready for a recession, is get your baseline data now, capturing people's needs and circumstances before the recession starts, if it comes. Because that allows you to go back to ministers and say, we're now 30% of people additionally are in this situation than they were before the recession started. Um, now, citizen advice are clearly a really, really powerful source of data because you've got so many different areas that people come to you about. But if you are a smaller or more medium-sized charity, and you have an advice service, use that. So even if your advice service is single-faceted, what you're able to do with the advice service is to show, is to flag very quickly to civil servants, has there been a shift? Has there been a shift in a pattern of demand? And also, um, if you're able to point out to them how th there's been a shift in relation to the implementation of a major piece of government policy. So I've mentioned the universal credit before. The obvious thing that's coming up is the energy price cap this autumn. Is so to get those data systems ready to pick up any shift in relation to um, government policy. Local relationships. So I would really want to strongly endorse um, what Barbara Keely has said around the persuasive power of local stories. Local stories, in our experience, are very influential with MPs, particularly MPs in marginal seats. So Rishi Sunak's 26th of May package on the cost of living was really a, a, hu a response to the groundswell of concern that came from Conservative MPs in red wall seats. So in terms of those local relationships, what the Salvation Army has tried to do is to gather the stories, but also show MPs the data in their area. So in one of the areas that we're campaigning on is the contraction in the British labour force that's taken place in recent years. So the government of the Bank of England has, has said that there's been a bigger shrinkage in the British labour force in the last two years than took place in the global financial crisis. So if I'm going to your surgery, um, I would want to show you a story of someone the army has helped back into work, but also say to you, here is the data in your constituency about the number of people, including the number of women, the number of people who've got disabilities, who've left them at the labour market altogether. Thirdly and lastly, sharp messaging. Fair share and supported by Marcus Rashford really scored effectively with the sharpness of their messaging around holiday hunger. You know, you'd had a whole series of charities campaigning very well on holiday hunger for 20 years. But Fair Share and Marcus Rashford's campaign really cut through because of its really tight and well-crafted social media messages. So, just to round up, try and get your data systems ready and agile in order that you can go back to officials and report on trends that they wouldn't otherwise be aware of. Secondly, is build those local relationships 
provide MPs, particularly in marginal constituencies, the opposition parties, as well as the incumbent Conservative government, with the stories, but augment them with the data so you can see that these are not just anecdotes. These are things that relate to broader patterns of demand. And thirdly, hone your messages so that when an MP leaves that surgery, he or she, it's lodged in the back of their brain your key argument. That's fascinating, Matthew. Thank you. Um, li listening to particularly you three um, brings to mind a, a time shortly after what was then called, uh, young, younger people in the audiences won't make anything, but there was one thing called uh, Web 2.0. Um, that was how exciting it was, which was um, it, it, essentially it was, we were all concentrating on the, on the ability to turn our print products into, into uh, digital products, that was Web 1.0, and then suddenly um, uh, somebody tapped us on the shoulder and said, there's this thing called Web 2.0, everybody can now um, talk to everybody else, and that was a shocking thought, um, and not a comfortable thought if you're a newspaper publisher. Um, and, and I was with a, 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 new, new, a new tech guru in, in New York, who said, the thing is that you don't understand, Alan, is that everybody is now a media company. and um, uh, the, the more I've thought about it over 15 years since, essentially you're all media companies as, as, well, as, the, um, uh, as the w well as the work that you're doing. I imagine you've all got people, including yourselves, who are thinking, as we've heard tonight, well, how can I package this up into a story that we can tell or, or data uh, and, and get that into the sharpest possible messaging. Um, and, and so that, that communications bit of the work that you're doing, I imagine, has become ever more important and, and trying to get attention in a, in a very sort of crowded world. Um, it, it's fascinating. I'm, I'm, I'm also fascinated uh, between the power of stories and the power of data. I, I wonder if any of you could unwrap that a bit, because I can, I can totally see from your point of view Somebody comes into your constituency and there's just a moment of connection uh, and they've got you for 10 minutes and suddenly something gets through um, and how powerful that is. And yet I think all three of you in different ways have said, yes, but we can do that through data as well. Does anybody want to sort of pick that up as a point? So I think there's something about the difference between data and analysis. Data does nothing by itself. You have to be able to explain why. Um, and ideally, as, as you said, then so what? So why is this happening? And so what should we do about it? And I don't think data can tell you the why or the so what. You have to have the insight. You have to have the lived experience. Um, so I, th I think you have to have the whole package. Um, I, I would say I think the charity sector is very, very good at telling stories. Um, it's very, very powerful. I think that's both in our fundraising and in our um, uh, uh, and in and in our campaigning, um, I would say we're not always as good at, at the data, and I think that can undermine us with with government um, quite significantly. Yeah. yeah, Lara. Yeah, I'd agree with that. It's definitely the combination of of data and stories. Um, I think that data's got to be trusted. It's got to be reliable. Um, you have to be as honest with your data as you can be. Um, I know everyone sort of tweaks stats here and there to, to make it fit your headline, but um, it's got to be trusted first and foremost. Um, and I think another thing around data is sometimes that big number is helpful, um, but actually that local data, the constituency level data is actually where there's real power as well. Um, and often sometimes things like comparing to other constituencies, how, how, how is my constituency doing compared to the next door constituency is a really helpful tool as well. So. <laughs> It is a bit about that analysis of like how do you take those numbers but make it meaningful for the person that you're talking to. Yeah, from interest in it. So it's national is helpful, but I think that local local data is I mean, I mean, you're even talking about headlines. You're using the language of of, of, <laughs> of, of editors. Um, I mean, it's, it's it is the classic tabloid approach. Is is you you begin with a story to get somebody interested in. It's a human story, and then. When it's done really well, you then pull back and say, well, this story is illustrative of this problem. 
and here's the data that, that shows that, that the, the validity of, of this story. Um, I mean, do you, do you actually have, as it were, little mini newsrooms? I mean, that would be the wrong term, but I mean, just, yeah, well, t tell us about your team. And, and, uh, so we have a news team. Who you have a news team. Well, there you are. Yeah. Um, who work really closely within our advocacy department, so with policy and uh, with advice. So, but it's not just about sort of getting headlines, sort of recognising that media is a really good channel to help amplify your messages. And if the people you're trying to reach are reading certain newspapers or publications, then actually getting something in there which they might see is, is helpful if you're not being able to make that contact one-on-one -on -one or get that meeting with them instead. It's just an, it's another route to achieving your own objective, not an objective in itself. And is there a sense in which legacy media, as I hate being called, but um, you know, we have to mm -hmm. face facts, uh, <laughs> are becoming less important in the sense that you can speak directly to the, to the audiences that you want to in, in the way that you want to, or is it is media still important? I think a range of channels is still really important. Mm -hmm. We've definitely been trying new things, so trying to do more engagement through Twitter, for example. Um, it's sort of the online newspapers, you've got more opportunity to think about how you present your data. So moving graphs as one example, it's something that brings your data to life and visual and helps your audience connect with it. So we've been experimenting a lot more with those and seeing, seeing what's short traction, but there's a, there's a place for all media, traditional and new. How much are you doing on TikTok? We have got a TikTok channel actually, okay, but um, okay. it's mainly advice based, so <laughs> okay. uh, rather than um, policy. <laughs> and Matthew, if I asked you that question about how you're structured mm. in terms of, uh, I'm just fascinated by what kind of operation you've got. Yeah. Given that you've got, you know, you've got to persuade um, Barbara here, but you've got to mm. persuade the Daily Mail or who, whoever else on, and local newspapers. And, and what, what, what kind of operation have you got? Well, we also have our newsroom. Um, in terms of that, one of the, the I think the things that is important for us is media that influences other media. So, because you're, you're saying about legacy, how far in terms of that, um, I was asking journalists about this, and as influential as social media still is, you still see things like Good Morning Britain that can set the agenda for other other media outlets. The Today programme can still set the agenda for other media is Sunday for Monday stories can still be. So I think I wouldn't downplay the influence of traditional media that influences other media. Um, Anoushka Astana, a journalist who you know, worked on The Guardian, Observer, and Sky, she said, the thing I want to see, Matthew, is someone else to pick up my story. So when um, I work with her, there was um, a story that um, she used a database story showing that work, being a working mother did not damage the educational attainment of your children and the Telegraph picked it up like that. And so even though you could say the Telegraph's perspective might be more socially conservative, they picked up her story. So that's the... Um, the, the last thing I'd say about um, data and stories is I think data can be very influential with individual backbench MPs, I'm uh, sorry, in, in stories can be influential with individual backbench, but when you're sitting down with the Treasury and you're sitting down with spending controllers, they will really, really challenge the representativeness of your data, they'll challenge the rigour of your data. And the other thing that data can convey in a way that stories can't is an equality perspective. What are women's experiences of this, of um, of the current cost of living and, and how distinct are they? What are disabled people's experiences? What are the experiences of black women? You know, two thirds of um, black women are working in health and social care. So those, I mean, one thing from a really big data set that came out, understanding society, is women's, women who are living in overcrowded housing, it damages women's health far more than it damages men, male's health. Barbara, you, you, you were talking about um, particular, I mean, you were giving extremely good advice on, on, on the impact on local MPs, but in, in your present role and, and knowing what we're sort of bracing ourselves for in the autumn, what kind of story are you beginning to hear from charities about the, the load on them and how they expect to get through? I think as, uh, as, as a 
I was saying before before our, our event today started, um, there's a feeling, isn't there? I think which Matthew has also alluded to. This is the sort. Of, it's not even the calm before the storm, but the storm. We're not quite at the storm mm. yet. Um, but I think um, there are ways that uh, members of parliament can pick up. Uh, inside their own constituencies, what's going on? Um, uh, I, I mentioned the food charity that I'm, I'm involved with, the project I'm involved with, and walking out and actually talking to people. I think the difficulty uh, is going to be the, that problem of stigma that exists. Um, even where somebody has, has written to me uh, as a member of parliament and other other MPs to find this too and used an expression like, um, I'm having to choose between heating and eating, which was the one that was, you know, until the summer was, was, was quite often put, and, it, and the struggles are even worse than that now. If you then go back to them and say, do you want to be referred to a food bank? Do you want to be referred to, you know, but they'll say, no, 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 there are, there are people worse off than me. There's a, t a terrible stigma about that first step of help, if you like. And I, I you know, I, I think we'll all struggle to get people across that. And it's interesting that uh, Lara was saying that MPs are looking for where to refer people to. That's the most desperate thing, I think, where on earth to refer people to. Um, but I think all of those sources will become you know, massively um, overburdened. Um, I mean, now uh, the organisation that funds MPs' budgets had to step up during COVID the amount of uh, casework staff that, that we uh, we have because they just couldn't cope with the level of work we had in COVID. But it, it will go up again this year, very dramatically it will go up. Uh, so it, I, I think I, I really agree with Matthew in that point of, you know, s sort of gather data now or understand the picture now because it will, it will you know, get, be so different when all this hits when the um, October um, energy price increases mm. hit. Mm. Um, because I, I don't think people will know, you know just what to do, where to go, and I'm already starting to see people like that. And you would echo, presumably, everything that Barbara said. But, but I, I just wanted to, before you left it, the, the point you made about data is, is very important. Because I, I was talking about the, the stories and the qualitative side of, you know, really understanding what it's like to be, you know, um, a, per a person in the contaminated blood uh, uh, situation. But um, I did a lot of work before I became an MP on carers' issues. I was responsible and worked with a charity on uh, a, a survey of 4,000 carers about how the Labour government's national carer strategy was impacting on them and what changes they wanted to see. So I heard across a period of months so many stories from carers Yet when I became an MP, one of the most important things was to understand how many of those carers lived in my constituency. That I didn't know until I connected with the data. So the National Carers Organisations are very good um, on that, and you know that's that's why that's important. Um, you mentioned uh, members of Parliament in um, you know with, with uh, smaller majorities in, uh, in red wall seats and other uh, seats like that. Uh, that will be very important to them. Because in understanding whether an issue is important, you know, if you've got 20,000 carers, if you've got 30,000 people um, with, uh, with needs because they've got arthritis, then that's going to make you realise that that's an important issue. You know, the, the health services or the other services for those people is important. You know, that during the COVID pandemic, the number of carers went from about 8 or 9 million up to 13 million because so many more people were caring. So those, those statistics are very important indeed, I think. To your, to your point about those those stories and those insights, you know, I, I think the charity sector does have this incredible role to play as sort of an early warning system um, when things are going wrong. You know, you said you said about um, the advice to government during uh, the pandemic, um, you know, and it can come from those very small organisations, those organisations working straight on, on, on the front line every day, you know. Um, there was a piece in The Independent about baby banks um, and one of the volunteers there said, well, um, we started to realise that we were starting to get a lot of demand for dressing gowns for kids, and it was because families couldn't heat their homes. But that's what they were they were going for. So they are they are an early warning system, and I think for me it's about how government hears that. Um, and I think there is there is more work to be done. I think to um, uh, bring charities into government so that they are hearing those insights. Um, sort of some of the research we've done um, forthcoming is uh, looking at uh, the sort of balance between insight that ministers get from charities and from business. 
Um, and some, chari some, some departments are brilliant, you know, health, education, etc. Like there is very, very strong engagement with the charity sector. Their ministers are getting that insight. Um, but others, including the Treasury and the Cabinet Office, um, really that heart of government, that decision making organisations aren't getting it. Um, and I think one of the uh, sort of opportunities with new ministers coming in is actually can we ensure that when they're looking at their new working groups mm. and their sector councils, we're trying to integrate charities into that because you, you only hear the full picture if you are hearing from the full range of organisations we have in this country and, and, and the insight charities can bring is just incredible. I'm hoping that, that some of this has provoked or will provoke a question or two from, from the audience. Um, have we got a microphone, is it Joe or, or do, 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 oh, yeah, there's a microphone. So, so somebody, somebody raise a hand and, and we've, got a, we've got a hand or, already. Just, just here, Joe, in the Secretary of Bank. Hi, um, I'm Melissa from Sentence, and I'm just really helpful to kind of hear what everyone's saying. And obviously in an issue like the cost of living crisis, people are have being impacted in so many ways. So, you know, like energy bills are one thing, transport's another, kind of benefits levels are another. And obviously it's really important to be able to pay to full picture for MPs, but then you end up with a policy recommendation list that is about a page long. So I guess kind of what would you say is better is to kind of have that broader overview to show the whole picture or, you know, realising that you can't focus on everything. So, you know, we're just going to focus on what can change in energy or what can change in transport while realising that that's not going to help the whole picture. So it's like, do you, would you rather pay to a wider picture or really narrow down on one specific area that you could, so that you're not giving people too many um, problems to solve. You would like to say that? I can go first. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a challenge that we have daily at the moment, I think. Um, I think with the cost of living crisis, you need to be able to paint that full picture. It's not just that someone can't afford their energy bills, it's also that they are cutting back on food. You have to say they're not using their car anymore. They're, um, yeah, lots of everything that could be going on in their lives, and if you don't look at that in, to in total, you don't know what that person is experiencing, what family is experiencing. I think there's it's hard because you'll be talking to potentially different departments about those solutions. So you'd think, well, actually, that might be okay, but fundamentally, Treasury's got the decision, final decision. Um, so one thing that we're doing more of recently is thinking about: is there any non-fiscal asks that we can talk to government about? So maybe more onus on regulators, for example, or companies to be doing more, um, just so that we've got like the breadth of actually, yeah, more money in people's pockets is going to be really important. But if that doesn't, if that's not a goer, then actually, if, um, it's one of the things is around um, sort of mid-contract price rises that we're doing. So that could actually save people money if it was stopped. So thinking sort of outside of just us, the government, and just financial asks. But obviously, you can't do that across everything. Um, it's it's tricky because you so say you don't want to lose the breadth of you know deprivation is a is a multifaceted thing as we all know, um, but I suppose our experience would be when you're speaking to an individual MP, give them one thing, give them one take home message um, that can then focus the efforts. The other thing is in terms of proactive media initiatives, it's probably best to have a day where you simply focus on new evidence on, on food poverty or simply focus new evidence on energy poverty is with the civil servants you can show them the breadth you can show them the depth but it's about um, tight messaging as I said before so almost everyone in the sector was trying to keep the universal credit uplift and that's the type of thing where you know Alighting on one particular area, one particular policy ask, um, can generate greatest impact. Whereas if, P if you're telling, trying to tell eight to ten different stories, it can be simply not retained by MPs or even retained by people on the news desks. Yeah, I, I, I just want to echo that's exactly what I was going to raise, the, the benefits operating, you know, the power of that coalition coming together. And also I think what was quite important about that is it was cross-sector. It wasn't just within our sector. Um, there were other voices, there were voices from business, etc., also saying how important this was. 
Um, and I think we probably underutilize the unusual partnerships um, uh, that can help you uh, uh, make more progress. And cost of living is a brilliant example of this. You know, the unions and the business organizations are working together to not on, an, on, not on really specific policy asks because they have different views over what that should be. But they're saying this is a problem together. Um, and actually bringing the charity voice into that as well could, could potentially make it much more powerful having that, that three cross sector. Um, uh, I think that would definitely tell, turn heads, for example. But to your point around a range of options, I, on, on the points around civil servants, I think we all know that we, when we develop policy, sometimes, yes, that's the answer, but sometimes it's, that's a, one way of doing it. And, and you can open up those conversations if you're not precious about this particular, this particular wording or this particular amendment. Um, uh, and I think it's really healthy to be able to discuss a bunch of options, float a bunch of balloons and see which one sticks. I'm not sure balloons necessarily stick, but mixed <laughs> metaphor, but that's, that's what I'm trying to say. I'd also just add something, I don't know whether independent age are in the room, because um, they're on the original guest list, that you can be distinctive as well. So on, independent, on social care, you had virtually all of the sectors saying, there's not enough money in social care, there's not enough money in social care. But what independent age did is focus on how the additional money, if it was given, could be spent. And they scored by their distinctiveness. Another, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm Vicky Butler, I'm here from the Charities Aid Foundation. And thanks Barbara and Nicole for mentioning our research, that's, that's really helpful. Um, I mean, I think my question would be, perhaps a bit of a tricky question, what advice would you give to charities right now trying to influence in this present moment obviously we're in a bit of an unusual situation there's a leadership contest on um the government can't really bring in anything new until september and we've got summer recess coming as well yet we've got this storm coming in the autumn which would suggest now is the time the changes are needed and perhaps you know there isn't a right answer to this question but is there any advice the panel would give in terms of how to influence in this particular environment we have right now Barbara, what's the mood at Westminster? <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think the key thing's going to be sort of caution about making spending commitments. There's already a massive amount of caution about making spending commitments. And you've seen with the Conservative leadership uh, contest that they're wanting mainly to vie with each other for how much they're going to cut taxes. I think that, that, that feeds in. So um, I, I think, and I know that you are working on things which don't necessarily have, you know, which would require changes, which don't necessarily require um, making spending commitments. It's the next 18 months, 12, 12, 18 months, is going to be quite a difficult time to get pledges on spending commitments, and I think um, opposition parties will get nervous about it. Uh, but it's, I, I think, you know, as all discussing solutions rather than just pledging for a particular policy, I think, I think a lot of the time if you attend these events that we've talked about, you know, the, there'll be a board and they'll say, have a picture with this board and pledge this. And, and it, that, that'll just become harder and harder, the, the, the more general they can be. But I, I, th I think the main thing is going to be that nervousness about spending commitments because you know, the, the media broadly, what it does is just adds them all up and says, you know, the, uh, all, the, all the opposition, uh, the, you know, the other par parties you're opposing do as well and say, you, you, your shadow ministers have made spending commitments of this much. Um, so without wanting to get back to previous manifestos which were costed at a level that nobody found, you know, plausible, um, I, think, I think that's what will happen. And I think, unfortunately, the Tory leadership contest will just make that worse because they, they want to talk about cutting taxes. But I, th I, do, I do think where we've already made breakthroughs like social care and winning the argument about more spending on social care, we've absolutely got to dig in on that because mm. um, that difficult step has been taken as much as we didn't agree um, with the national insurance route to getting that extra money, there has to be that extra money for social care. Any other, I mean, it, it was it, admittedly a hard question, but, but, it, but the sort of, how are you thinking from, you know, really you're thinking from, from now to September when we expect the real bite to, to, to start? I think Barbara's warning is a very salutary one in terms of all of the opposition parties because of the scrutiny they face. So I suppose how I've seen different organisations manage to overcome it in the past is rather than simply go to the manifesto writers and say, please, will you adopt this, you know, my detailed cost, is actually to ask the question, what can we do 
as a pressure group, as a charity or an NGO to help you make this politically deliverable. So one example of that, and I can use this on because I, I, I can't get anything, I have nothing to do with it, no credit, is um, data, debt, aid, trade, Africa, that is, they work very effectively in, in a savvy way with David Cameron when he was opposition leader. Mm -hmm. And they want to try and get David Cameron to adopt the 0.7 commitment um, to aid, which was, you know, clearly had a huge price tag. And um, basically what data did is they you know, effectively agreed to David Cameron that if he put it in the Tory manifesto, they would celebrate that. So, you know, David Cameron wanted to reposition the Conservative Party, as you all know, wanted to sort of project a more centrist appeal. And the leaders of data turned up at the Tory party conference in 2009 and basically gave David Cameron a big clap for adopting their policy. So it's going to be really difficult with all of the parties financially with the budget deficit we've got. So to ask is for them is for all of you to ask the question is what, how can we help you in political parties? It might be help you re remold public opinion in terms of the, as opposed to simply present you with compelling policy asks in isolation from the politics. We've got time for one more question. If, 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 yeah, please. Okay. Um, Alex Murdoch. I'm a. I used to be a professor of charity management. Um, to what extent do you think it's a good ask to not ask for money? To basically approach government and say, our ask is not for money, but it's for perhaps a change in regulations, a change in permission, a change to enable something to happen um, and that you in effect look on the other side of the table and say effectively there isn't a lot of money but there might be the potential for other things. So I'd, I'd say that that would be um, music to the Treasury's ears um, but that's probably not a new statement. Um, that has probably been the case for a very long time. Um, uh, yes, there is absolutely power in those organisations, in, in those approaches um, and we probably don't look enough at those. Um, I would also say um, how local government approaches things. Um, we haven't touched on local government, but for smaller charities in particular, they are much more important than, than what national government does. Um, and then also what the regulators can do without any politicians getting involved at all, quite frankly. Um, uh, so yes, there's, there's absolutely um, potential there. And, and um, I do think the Charity Commission, for one, is in, in an interesting position at the moment with um, uh, new chair in, they've got a sort of enhanced policy function, they're, they're looking to do more for the sector and I, I think that's quite an interesting approach too, not on a topic basis, but, but for the sector as a whole. I mean, I used to be a chair of the mayor's community and a lot of the issue there was about getting planning permission for the conversion of buildings for social enterprise. And we, we often weren't really asking for money, what we were asking for was a change of use of brownfield sign. And sometimes it's not even, it's not legislation, it's not regulation, it's guidance and approaches and, and, and that can make as much of a difference um, <laughs> depending on your field. In some areas, yeah, they need more money. Uh, our is more than up. Um, so I just wanted to thank the, uh, the fantastic panel for coming along and sharing their wisdom uh, this evening. Thank you for the audience for coming. Thank you for our online viewers. Uh, thank you again to Vulio for their support. And um, for those who are here in person, if you would like a drink, and I, it's Thursday night and um, it's nearly six o'clock, so I think we all deserve one. Uh, if we just go upstairs to the garden room uh, and um, uh, I'll see you up there. But thank you for coming and thank you for the guests.